Welcome to the Moto 17 series roadmap. Um, I'm very excited to share this with you. Um, this is going to be interesting because I think this is going to be the most honest demo you guys have ever seen. You know, the reason for that is the work that we have done in Moto over the past year has been the biggest change that has ever happened in the history of Moto. It's risky, it's challenging, and the reason why we're doing it is because the benefits it's going to offer once we ship it to you guys, but more importantly, what we can do after. And that's why this is the beginning of a new moto. And so what we're going to go over is actually first 17.0 uh, alpha performance demo, feature enhancements, the 17.1 roadmap, and the 17.2 roadmap. So as far as performance is concerned, there are two things. This is view objects and incremental tool updates. Now I'm going to go ahead and make sure I turn off my video capture device. And so that you guys don't have to see me on top of this slide deck and uh, mesh view objects. I've talked about this many times. Um, I don't, I don't think I even really understand mesh view objects. Mesh view objects was something that was conceived of by Stuart uh, Ferguson, one of the, you know, the original architect of Moto and something that Chris Haig had the, the incredible nerve to <laughs> take on. And I'm nothing but impressed by what he's been able to do with it. So mesh view objects um, is a core change that is the foundation of the future Moto. It enables us to iterate on performance enhancements much faster and with much greater flexibility than in the past. Our goal is to get view objects and well 17.0 into a stable and performant state. We need your help with this task. For this reason, we are going to postpone the release of Moto 17. It'll be early 2024. Now I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. Um, we need to make sure that the new Moto, the beginning of the new Moto is something that you guys enjoy and that every single release that you get after it, excuse me, just kicks but because that's what I see the potential of what we're going to do. And I'll explain to you more about why. And I think 17.1 and 17.2 will help articulate that. Now, there's an analogy I've been passing around. Uh, and everybody's, it's kind of, people are yes, no, yes, no about this analogy. Um, basically, what we've been doing is uh, we cleaned up a hoarder house, a hoarder mansion. When I picture Moto, well, yeah, no, no KR graphics. I, I thought about it, but I decided not. You know, this is YouTube. I don't want to be, be uh, censored in, in any way. So basically, I, when I think of Moto, the image I get in my head and the image I want you guys to have in your head is of this big, giant mansion that really hasn't been, you know, hasn't, uh, has kind of, you know, been through the years, right? It's been around for a long time. And there's this, this great mansion I found a picture of online. I can't share it because it's copyrighted. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's, it became a hoarder home. And somehow they filled up like this gigantic house with stuff piled in every single room. And then they showed the process of going through and rehabbing this house. And the first thing they had to do was clear everything out. And so if I were to explain to you the state that we're in right now, is we've gotten everything off the floor. We can see how good everything we want to use is. There's some stuff piled up on top of chairs and on the couch, the stuff we want to keep around. But this is a fresh start and we will clean up the floors, we'll fix some walls, and eventually we're gonna have a beautiful home that is the envy of everyone, all right? And so remember, we've gotten everything off the floor right now. That's where we're at. So. We are going to have an extended public and alpha beta period because of the value of broad testing based on our past experiences with public betas. Tool incremental updates. Many tools have the ability to follow a new code path. That's what incremental co uh, code path is. In practice, what this means, any operation like a tool does not create geometry, which saves a whole lot of calculation time. This has been applied to edge relax, edge chamfer, clone effector, effectors and procedural modeling. So you're going to like all these tools too, they are direct and procedural modeling enhancements. And this is what I, I'll show you some videos uh, showing the actual performance enhancements for these tools. They're big performance enhancements. Taz, Richard, a whole bunch of people contributed to this and did an amazing, amazing job. Clone effector, that's a tool pipe item. That's something that applies to a whole bunch of different tools. Now, Again, this is challenging to develop. This is a public alpha. You are going to run into problems. We want you to tell us your problems. We're going to interact with you about those, and that will make sure that we are able to get the best moto out to you possible. So 17.0, I'm going to do kind of 
a little bit more like a traditional demo of various aspects of 17.0 and view objects. And then we'll talk about a few of the videos that we did at the, uh, the SIGGRAPH live stream because that is the expectation that I placed on the team for this is the performance that we need to hit and we need to maintain. All right, and that's what we're gonna need help from you guys identifying that we are hitting it, that we are maintaining it. All right, guys, so now we're on to the demo portion of this presentation. And what I'm gonna be demoing you uh, to you is a couple of the things that you're going to notice in view objects that are really advantageous and that we want more feedback on so that we can make these perform as well and as consistently as possible. So the first one I wanna to talk to you about is the kind of incremental loading nature of view objects. So let's go ahead and uh, let's open up a scene and uh, I'm gonna load up this Xterra bundled scene. And this is a model I work on on my personal time. Um, and what you're gonna notice is it came in really fast. It, you know, individual items jumped in. It is a simple model. But as I rotate around it, um, I'm gonna get my textures later. So you don't have to wait for the textures to load, as you can see here. So this is kind of an ideal example of the incremental loading nature of view objects. This isn't going to always work every time. And that's what we want as much feedback on as possible. The more feedback, the more cases where it isn't working well, um, the better we can address that and the more consistent we can make it. Um, some things that I've noticed is if you're really far away from your item, it has some trouble. So, you know, just something for you to look out for. But, you know, being able to enter your scene and start working on it and playing around with it, uh, you know, before everything is fully loaded up is fantastic. And it's something that as we move farther into view objects throughout 2024 is going to be leveraged in many more new and really exciting ways. Um, so that example is simple, right? The, I mean, the geometry is simple. There's not many meshes here. And this is just a, uh, I'm, I'm trying to turn a truck into a camper. Uh, so I just can't you know, resist the opportunity to kind of show you guys what I'm trying to think uh, about a pop top uh, kind of SUV truck camper. Anyway, that's what I do on my free time. So let's close this scene on down and let's open up something much more geometrically and rigging challenging. And so uh, let's hop on over to Jan's War Jeep. I love Jan's War Jeep. If you watch any of our streams, then you already know that. And uh, this you're gonna notice with most of the files you load in 17.0. Um, if you have any sort of uh, elements in the schematic and you have uh, on, on, you know, in assemblies, there, in the past, we had a no duplicate tag on them and you couldn't get rid of it. Now you can, this dialogue will go away probably when we get close to release, but this will allow you to duplicate any of your assemblies once you enable it. All right, so now we're loading up this 18 million poly war Jeep. You can see how it's loading up incrementally, individual meshes, and I'm able to interact immediately. Now, you will run into pauses during these loading sessions, especially when it's loading a really large mesh. Like right now, I just tried to rotate and there was a pause. More examples we can get from you guys of that, the better we can handle these situations. And uh, you know, we are in alpha right now, so we expect you know, this and everything else having to do with view objects to continue to improve. But this is why we're putting out a public alpha and then a public beta and making sure we have a long public alpha and beta period. All right, so I think that's pretty awesome and the performance is really great. I'm just gonna take the opportunity to kind of go on a tangent though and, uh, and show off the wireframe shading uh, that is new in 17.0 for the advanced viewport. It is beautiful. Now, I am at a thickness of three and, uh, and that, you know that's gonna affect how things look as you zoom out. But if you compare this to 16.1 uh, V8, the zooming out you know, black shading is dramatically better. And now let's go on over to 16.1 uh, V8 and take a look at what it looks like. Now, first off, notice as I'm tumbling around, right? I am running fraps in the lower left-hand corner and it's at uh, 21, 22 frames per second. And if I zoom in here, you can see that, you know, we've got these points. So I'm gonna make sure that mesh is selected, which it was. Uh, and I'm gonna increase my subdivision level. Yeah, it's already a a very large mesh moto, so you go ahead and you raise it. But you see you get these points in between, and it's really disturbing when you have uh, wireframes all over the place. It kind of looks like a dashed line. But that no longer happens in 17.0, which I think is just absolutely fantastic.
Okay, so incremental loading is something I'm a big fan of. We need a lot of examples. If you guys can share scenes with us, that is only going to help with uh, uh, help us make that even more consistent over time. All right, so now let's go on over to a mesh transforms example. And there's some interesting stuff here where essentially grabbing um, uh, an entire mesh without any selections, which, you know, nothing is selected, everything is selected in Modo, you see a big difference. Selecting and then moving it, we don't. And this is a, one of the types of examples that, you know, we need more examples of. This is also an earlier alpha because I wasn't willing to change which uh, alpha version I was working on before making this demo. So let's take a look. And now let's talk a little bit about mesh transforms, just simple, you know, uh, component mode mesh transforms. So right now I am loading up Jan's um, AC Cobra model. Um, again, love Jan's model. And uh, Volker Troy helps out a little bit with this, providing a nice um, environment. This one uh, for me is a little bit slower to load because of the, the heavy shading. Uh, but you can see how it brought in the locators. It's working its way through. This is something that we will continue to improve throughout this alpha period. But this is an example of one that has a much harder time loading up incrementally. Again, I think it's due to the uh, no, more complicated shading that is, is going on. There's a lot of texture maps and stuff like that. Texture maps, um, you, like I was surprised I saw it in that exterior model. Like it's also fairly simple. It's just a projection texture. Um, but you see, there we go. Now, you know, once we got that body in, um, it just loaded up all the tires. And this is just a, a beautiful, beautiful mesh. Um, again, notice fraps down in the bottom left-hand corner. I like fraps because it, it does give you a, a reasonable um, kind of like estimate on what uh, your performance actually is. It kind of, kind of averages it for you, right? So let's go ahead and turn wireframe on here. Let's grab that. And so we can at least see what we're dealing with here. Fairly dense mesh. Uh, Jan modeled this much more cleanly. It was one subdivision level lower, but I needed to challenge it a little bit. And so let's go ahead and turn off our wireframe, select this mesh item, come into a polygon component mode, and let's start moving stuff around, right? And so this is what you're gonna see. You notice that mesh tearing? This is one of the consequences that we're working on with mesh view objects. This is something we can correct. It's happening less and less. But you can also see that my interactivity is really high. It's 40 frames per second. Um, and so for a mesh like this, that is pretty darn impressive. And if I were to go ahead and uh, just switch on over to look at only a single item, uh, you can see that's you know, 781,000 sub D polys. And I'll come back on over to the full mesh. Absolutely love this mesh, Jan. Now uh, let's come on over to 16.1 v8 and let's do the same now first notice the interactivity in the scene it's not as good um, i have some trouble your mileage is going to vary um, some people um, have even seen better performance uh, you know in situations like this in 16.1 exactly why we need this to uh, get feedback from a lot of users on a lot of hardware so i'll turn wireframe off here and let's go ahead and just start trying to move this around and i can move it it i i can't put it where I want to put it <laughs> um, and it's running at four frames per second and as you can see there and it's very it, it's a painful experience and one of the problems with communicating the benefit of view objects is sometimes you won't even see a uh, an FPS increase but you will have an interactivity increase now this doesn't perfectly articulate that idea but kind of gets it across so I'm going to select this tire over here W key for the move tool. And as I start yanking around, you can see I am in 16, one V8 still. I'm getting three frames per second. And anytime in this video, if you wanna, if I forget to mention, or in these videos, if I forget to mention, if you look up here at the top and it says Modo, it's 16, one V8. If it says main, then it's 17, O alpha. And again, yanking that around three frames per second. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you this too, because these are kinds of, kind of the things that we need to really um, nail and we need a lot of feedback on. So I just selected 15 polygons right there on the tire, W key for the move tool. And there we go. I yanked that around. I get a very good frame rate, um, 30 FPS. It's quite good. And 17.0, there's a, a discrepancy there. So I want to make sure you guys are aware of that and, uh, you know, report situations where you see similar things. So over in 17.0 now. Again, notice my interactivity 
is way better. Um, it just feels a whole lot smoother. Another tip under system and preferences, if you're gonna use the advanced viewport, um, if you come down to remapping, you wanna have your mouse uh, input device set to tablet. It gives way better interactivity and it's something that we're kind of working on being able to split the difference between mouse mode and tablet mode. Tablet mode is really interactive in a viewport. Uh, mouse mode is great for hauling and this is something that I think we could we could polish up uh, at least shortly after 17.0. Anyway, so uh, I have my mesh selected, come into a polygon component mode and W key for the move tool and I'm going to start yanking this around. Now you can see how the mesh is following behind. And that is something that, you know, the mesh is being generated and not in a background thread essentially, and not interrupting my ability to move the object around. And so the placement is so, so, so much better. There are still little hiccups here and there, but the interactivity is fantastic. And you can see it represented with the FPS. Again, you get these tearing issues every now and then, like you just saw. We wanna hear reports on issues like that because these are the problems that we want to solve. Now, if I come on in here and I, eh, we're gonna try and get the same, same geometry. And so, uh, I remember it was 15 polygons, right? And so uh, we're at 12, so probably just those inside there, 14. There's another one somewhere, so 15, it's about, it's about the same. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start pulling this around. You can see it's not quite as fast as it is in 16.1 uh, in V7, you know, that's that's a bug. That's something that we'd wanna see filed as a bug. And so we, we're gonna need you to compare 17.0 to 16.1 uh, V8 and make sure we know, you know, like, hmm, where, where, where have things regressed? Because that is just in the inherent nature of an alpha and a development process. And the more feedback we get on that, the better. But you can see the potential of it. And again, we are pushing um, moving this mesh around to a background thread, to one background thread. More on that later, more exciting stuff on that later. Okay, so yeah, th like there's a lot of good things that are happening technologically. Um, you know, th this one thing we, we wanna reemphasize to you, you are gonna have crashes in the alpha. You are going to have hangs in the alpha. Um, we are actually going to include all of these scenes um, with the alpha download. So there'll be another section for you to download all the scenes I show in here and more because uh, these are scenes that we are using for our internal testing. And so they're for us a very known quantity. Any scenes you guys have, we'd love to have those too. But it's very cool being able to share these and you try it. But yeah, like Volker just said, you really have to try it and experience it. It does feel really good. It doesn't demo well on a video and that has been a source of concern for us for sure. Um, but anyhow, it's, uh, this is a better experience and we'll talk about what this is going to lead to as we get further in, in this demo. Let's check out more about 17.0 now. So, do you guys care about animation playback? We do. So, um, animation playback is one of the most confusing aspects of U-Objects and we need a lot of testing here. So, I'll show you this. Now let's talk a little bit about animation playback. This one is gonna be interesting. We need a lot of testing on animation playback and there's a lot of information to share with you guys so it can be tested well. So I'm gonna try and get the, through this one as quickly as possible. Um, right now I'm in 16.1 V8. I'm gonna come over to 17.0. You notice it already looked different, right? Um, I'm gonna just talk about the viewport really quickly. Again, I'm in the advanced viewport and you notice that I do have environment lighting. You can see the color on the surface. And as I navigate around the viewport, the shadow is moving over the surface, right? And the reason for that is a new option in the advanced viewport options for uh, lighting to be default plus environment. And so now we can at least mix the viewport lighting with environments because it does produce such nice shading. Uh, you can't do that in, in 16.1 V8. You sort of can, um, what you do, and yeah, of course I'm going off on a tangent, uh, is you come over and you set it to default viewport, which is like, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's all right and uh, background, you set it to environment, and then you actually get both of them, right? You get, you get the, the two blended together, but then you have to deal with the background being an environment. So it's kind of, uh, 
you know, uh, not, not, not the best. Now you also can come over to drawing and control, and then you can set the GL background to, uh, you know, right now it's none. We could switch over to be a gradient, but you see nothing happens here. It's very confusing. So anyway, made it way easier to get the results that you want. And I'm going to come back over here to scene plus environment, and I'm going to turn it back over to default viewport so that we can have a little bit of consistency here. And I'm going to come back over to 17.0. And so let's come over to the camera view. And I'm just going to leave that alone. I'm going to pull up the timeline. And I'm also going to pull up my playback settings. All right. And you can see that play real time you guys are familiar with. Sync playback drawing is new. I also am, uh, I have locators visible in the viewport right now, right? Now, as I mentioned, I need to come over to my advanced options, switch that over to scene plus environment now um, so that we, uh, we actually have kind of more of an apples to apples comparison. All right, so I am going to leave sync playback drawing on. What sync playback drawing does is it syncs the bones and the meshes because view objects sends out information separately, right? And it's going back to one single background thread right now. And uh, one of the first things we saw and we showed you during the SIGGRAPH presentation is a disconnect between the bones and the mesh. And I'll show you a little bit more on that. And so when you have sync playback drawing on, our goal is just to get it back up to the speed of 16.1 V8. That's the goal for 17.0 with sync playback drawing on, all right? And it doesn't run beautifully. It's right now at 8 FPS. It's around 18 in 16.1 uh, V7. And so let's go over, excuse me, 16.1 V8. And uh, I'll pop open the timeline here, and I'm going to go ahead and play this back. Yeah, 18 frames per second. It's a little bit, you know, below half the speed. Now, it's not good, but that's also because sync playback drawing is a way for us to reconnect the bones and the mesh to run at exactly the same speed, right? Now, if I come on up here into my viewport properties and I come over to visibility, um, I want to turn off show locators. And now let's go ahead and play that back. And it usually rises a little bit, might not be very much right now due to recording, but I usually rise one to three frames per second uh, when I turn off locators. Now let's come on over to 17.0 uh, um, and let's pop this open and let's turn uh, visibility of locators off here, right? And let's go ahead and start playing that back. Now sync playback drawing is on. So it's actually still syncing that information. So it's still only running at eight FPS. So let's turn sync playback drawing off. And I actually I'm kind of realizing I probably should show this to you so you at least see the, the disconnect between the two. Um, so locators are on right now. You can see it's running at 60 FPS. It's running much faster. Now there is some debate, like is it really running faster? It's calculating data a whole lot faster. And so we have more work to do to kind of finesse what happens during animation playback. So this is one we need lots of help and feedback and scenes and videos from you guys on to really nail down because you know what we're certain of is the data is being managed way more intelligently than it was in the past. And so we need to wrangle that and get it to update in the viewport as quickly as possible. One of the big reasons why we're in a public alpha, which I don't think we've ever had a public alpha actually before. We've only had public betas and, you know, I have time to really polish this up for you folks. All right. So I'm going to stop the playback and now I'm going to come over to turn off show locators. And you can see that it's now running at like 60 frames per second, but play real time is on, right? And so it went up to 70, but if I turn play real time off, it just goes crazy. Now it is skipping frames, but it's calculating data that fast. And it's going up to 180 frames per second. So we just need to figure out how we can get it to make sure it's catching every single frame or as many as possible. Um, but again, what we have a lot of work to do with over the next year, 17.0 and beyond, is wrangling this data. But this is a foundation that enables big, big, big improvements like going up to speeds like this. But I want to make sure you understand it's not entirely represent, uh, representative of what you're going to see in this alpha, right? Okay. Okay, so let's come back over to uh, 16.1 V8, and uh, I will open up the playback settings, and let's turn off play real time here and see what happens. You can see that it's it actually kind of um, gets a little bit slower, uh, it, 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 or as far as frames per second is concerned, but it is trying to play it back in real time. 
um, and you know it doesn't go anywhere above 18 frames per second so we've unlocked this thing that we can you know start to manipulate to make playback faster and faster and faster and for additional playback let's uh, let's take a look at the shark scene from Greg Lillenberger and uh, I'm just gonna go to play this back in 16 1 v8 it runs at a good speed you know it's 19 FPS there's three sharks they're all in sync with each other I'm not showing locators right now uh, really doesn't change things much when I do it certainly doesn't uh, it slows it down a little bit but not much you know um, but yeah you know acceptable performance uh, play real time is on if I turn that off it you know it rises just a little bit um, but yeah we want to get well beyond this though right now don't get too excited um, it's has the potential to be way better. So I'm going to show you some of the things that you're going to see in relation to this, right? Um, and uh, and what we're doing to improve everything. So anyway, now we're in 17.0, and I'm going to go ahead and start playing it back. And you can see that it's it's 14 frames per second now. My settings for play real time and the sync playback drawing have uh, been you know are both on already, and I'm going to turn off sync playback drawing. And I need to go ahead and stop it and start it up again. And you can see that, you know, it's actually playing back at a really high frame rate. Um, and it's hard to tell. And you get those little those little pops of the geometry every now and then. It's a, a, a geometry flicker. Um, you'll also notice it on textures. There will be a texture flicker. And so you might see it. There we go. You see it on the, the center shark right there. Um, but what we see data wise is all the stuff is being calculated and so we just need to wrangle how it comes into the viewport right and here's the interesting bit the thing that was really like you know exciting because it it displays that there's more capacity behind the scenes all right and so it'll take a little bit of effort to get it truly working but you notice that as i move around in the viewport the frame rate jumps up higher if I am not recording, it'll go as high as 160 frames per second. And so we're pretty sure we're getting close to understanding what the cause of that is. And we're also pretty confident it causes some slowdowns in elsewhere. I think it may be related to uh, UI because we have upgraded to QT6. Um, but it's interesting when you navigate around and interact with the scene that's playing back and it starts running at a faster rate. You'll see this in... A variety of scenes there's a shock absorber that we're sharing with you guys you'll see that there if you if you play back the uh, the shock absorber um, uh, spring actually winding uh, and you move around the viewport you notice it starts running a lot faster so it's a gem that we're trying to you know pull out of what's going on behind the code and again this is why we need your help testing these scenes out and of course I forgot to turn off play real time and so let's just take a look what happens with this scene when you turn off play real time. You see there's like a sync issue. It catches up. And uh, as I start navigating around, um, you'll see that, yeah, it, it starts playing back crazy fast, super high frame rate. So it wasn't from recording. Um, I just needed to turn off play real time. But it does go up to like even 180, 190 when I'm not recording. Yeah. And now, again, want to temper your expectations here. <laughs> This shows a lot of promise. Um, it's going to be a better experience for you when we actually truly release 17.0. It's also not going to be as far as we're going to be able to take it. You're not going to see this type of performance increase everywhere. And we're seeing all these little indicators that like, ooh, we can take advantage of all the work that we've done. But that's going to take work in and of itself. So 17.0 is going to be the beginning of this new modo and there's gonna be plenty of work for us to do after there may be even you know some things that we don't fix for 17.0 that we start updating in v1 and v2 and v3 because next year we are very committed to frequent v releases kind of like we did this year but more because the view objects work was so heavy this year so i just want to emphasize that to you guys don't expect too much from 17.0 um, really the biggest benefit is going to be, you know, what we see throughout the V releases and throughout V, uh, you know, 17.1 and 17.2. We just need to make sure we stabilize it and we get the most performance out of it, um, by the time we reach 17.0. All right. And so, uh, actually, uh, yeah, that's right. This video wouldn't actually, um, uh, uh 
I couldn't import it quickly enough uh, to actually give me a, a preview. So anyway, let's take a look at this. This is interaction with rigs. And so Red Gunner, this is essentially exactly what you're talking about. So now as far as interacting with rigs, um, there is a significant workflow advantage and a significant feel advantage. Um, the mesh is slower to update than the bones, but the bones run at a crazy speed. And over time, we'll be able to get the mesh to update more rapidly along with the bones. So first off, over here in 16.1 V8, let's just go ahead and, uh, sorry, I am abusing your project here, Greg, but I just love this cuttlefish. Um, and this cuttlefish is by Greg Lohenberger and shared in the content. You can see that I'm getting 18, 19 frames per second as I rotate um, that bone. And if I come on over here, I've got the same bone selected and the mesh actually popped into its correct orientation, which is great. And as I start rotating this, um, I'm getting 60 frames per second now. And I should also just uh, for due diligence, make sure my background is set to environment, which as you guys who watch this video know, Greg always does this and it always looks so pretty. Um, anyway, so let's go ahead and yank that around. And so, yeah, as you can see, 60 frames per second, which is pretty impressive. And we can go ahead and come on over to this left top locator. Um, and let's yank that around. You can see how the mesh is kind of lagging along behind it. You'll notice this more when there's a long joint chain, but 40, 50, 60 frames per second, you know, the experience of posing is way better. Um, Volker Troy was talking about how much more pleasant of an experience that is now. And we'll grab this over here in 16.1 V8, you can see about 18 frames per second. And so harder to pose. So there's a, a, a lot of advantages to view objects, even though the mesh does lag behind currently. And that's something that will decrease in frequency um, as we take view objects further. And like I alluded to before, more on that later. Now we're in Jan's Mosquito. Okay, all right. so. Um, if you give me just one second, I'm going to see if I can uh, improve this a little bit. It needs to come down. Some of the videos didn't process quite quickly enough. And so let's go ahead and replay that. So now as far as move that on. It's interacting with. Let me just mm, come on video. There we go. Now that should be playing back much so better. So now as far as interacting with rigs, um, there is a significant workflow advantage and a significant feel advantage. Um, the mesh is... ...with the alpha download. Okay. And so I'm gonna... Well, this video kind of sucks, before. but um, we'll start on with now the we're in Jan's mosquito. mosquito scene again. And uh, this is shared with you guys along with the alpha download. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and just grab the body controller right there, the, the body root. And uh, you can see as I'm moving this up and down in 16.1 V8, I'm getting about five frames per second, right? It's, it doesn't feel good. It feels very slow, very laggy. 17.0. Go ahead and yank that up and down. So about 15 frames per second. So a substantial increase, but the feel is beyond a 3x increase. It feels real time. And so, you know, this is a big aspect of 17.0. And if I do something more fun, like, you know, kind of make Jan's mosquito dance. I don't know how he feels about that. We're talking about, yeah, let's keep it on screen. So 14 frames per second, 13 frames per second. And then let's come on over to uh, 16.1 V7. That is, it's really hard to articulate. Um, it's really hard to manage to get it in the right place. It's also hard to articulate how dramatic the difference is in feel. And like if I wanted to even just do something silly, like make it jump from one set of feet to the other, I, it, it, it requires me to be extremely deliberate. Uh, now let's come on over to uh, 17.0 again and do exactly the same thing. And it's just a comfortable experience, right? Now, not every aspect is going to show the same improvement. Some may even regress. This is what we need to know from you guys to make sure we, we get experiences like this 
um, in as many places as possible uh, by the time we, we release next year. All right, so now I'm, you know, I am in 17.0. Let's open up the wings, about 30 frames per second. Let's come on over to 16.1 v7 and open up the wings. It's really rough. It's five, six, and it'll go up to eight, but that's usually when it's like, it's, uh, it, there's a fairly short range for me to haul on right now. And so I'm hitting the end and that's when it seems to spike up. But it's, yeah, seven, eight frames per second. I was getting five earlier. Um, and uh, yeah, 20, 28, 30. So big, big, big difference. And uh, let's go ahead and come on over to the head as well. Twenty, twenty-one frames per second, and uh, sixteen one v seven. Wrong one. I'm supposed to grab the I command region. So twelve, thirteen. There's not as many dependencies here, or many things as far down the chain. Let's also open up the. Uh, um, proboscis, <laughs> the mouth needle. Um, yeah, I don't know what to call that. We're going to go with proboscis and pretend I know what I'm talking about. Somehow I, I feel like if Ed Fer Ferrari is watching this, he probably knows what it's called and it's just correcting me. He's just really good with stuff like that. Anyway, 18 frames per second. And uh, we come back over to 17.0 and uh, haul that. So yeah, it's 23, 24, so it's not dramatically faster. Um, but now let's come on over to the feet and let's just slide it along the surface. And so we're, and this is the easy one to haul. So 52 frames per second in 17 now. And, uh, and 16 one V eight 30. So, you know, nice, nice doubling in speed there. All right. So very nice, uh, you know, enhancements that we're seeing in just interacting with rigs, especially on mechanical rigs like this. All right, all right. Sorry that video didn't upload in time. See how it's taken up all that space. Let me just get the presenter view back again, and we'll move on to the next video. And so that was all about playback and editing. So now as far as... And uh, all right, so that's the primary demo portion of like, here's me really kind of interacting and playing with it and doing more than just doing a, a playback of, of, you know, here's how much faster it is, right? But these videos are about that. These are the videos from SIGGRAPH. And the reason why I want to show these to you guys again is because these are our performance expectations. And so you guys will have these scenes. Uh, I think all of them. I don't think there's any we can't share. Um, but when you see a regression on those scenes, then we know that there's something we need to fix. And so please download those scenes. Please check it out as the alphas and the betas come out. And so the first one is edge slice. Now, edge slice is an interesting one because the first click down still has a bit of a delay in 17.0, but once you drag it, it's like 30, 40 times faster or something like that. It's absolutely ridiculous. And this is a very nice mesh from Palo Ferrara. Really appreciate this, uh, Palo. Looks like my video is having a hard time keeping up. Hopefully you guys are seeing all this okay. And uh, we'll just hop into this area. This, this mesh that I'm performing the slice on, by the way, is 180,000 face type polys. And so it is in a single mesh layer. So that presents a challenge. But you can see right here, a little bit of delay when you click on it, but then once you, and as you haul on it, it's also, you know, slow because this is 16.1 v7. So it's down around one or two FPS. And just for the sake of time, you get the idea. I'm going to skip on through this. 17.0, same exact example. Let's go ahead and get back here. There we go. That first one comes in beautifully. Click, a little bit of a delay, but then, I mean, it's insane. It's over 100 frames per second um, compared to one or two. And so these are our performance expectations. That means, you know, this is what you should expect to see especially when you can test on an identical scene like this. But again, we want your scenes. We want to test against this. The, little, the initial click uh, down thing is something we do think we can solve in the future, but it requires a different performance enhancement, which go figure, few objects might help with. All right, so next up, 
let's go on uh, over to uh, Loop Slice. You guys have seen this before, and this is just wild. So I love this mesh because I made it. <laughs> but um, you can see how I'm performing a Loop Slice on this dense glove. And that's something I really would dread doing. 1.5 frames per second. I have no control over this. Um, and uh, you can you can see just how painful it is to interact with. And we jump on over here to the 17.0 pre-alpha. This was a while ago, but these are our, our, our performance expectations. Go ahead and select. I only need to select one edge, but I guess I'm lazy. Um, huge increase in performance with uh, with edge slice. And these are face type polys. They are not sub D's, and sub D's adds extra overhead. And let's go on over to uh, our next one, and that is rig editing. Um, and this is actually a whole lot faster. I didn't get time to record it in the latest uh, alpha, but it is actually a lot faster now in the latest alpha than it was over the summer. But 16.1, you can see 12 to 16 frames per second for the head. I'm going to let this one play through so we at least uh, really show you the difference. 17.0, 50 to 60. I was getting 80 earlier, uh, earlier uh, this week. Really, really great big performance enhancement. And, you know, rotating the eyes, 16.1 is 15 to 18. And then uh, we have a, a big jump there. So um, once we get over to 17.0, and I just couldn't help but keep on playing around with spinning those freaking eyes around. So 17.0, 50 to 60 frames per second. So really big improvement with, uh, with you know, editing rigs like this. Now, again, this is an ideal case. Go figure, William Vaughn makes excellent high performance rigs. Um, yeah, just scaling it and having fun with it, 16 to 19, and then over to uh, 17.0, and we'll, we'll see a nice improvement there too. Um, but this one is shared uh, along with the alpha that you'll, you guys will be downloading next week. So 50 to 60 frames per second. So big enhancements here. So please do look at these videos. We'll, uh, we'll share these, these performance expectation videos with the alpha as well, so you guys have that to compare with and identify where there are problems. Uh, you know, we'll get there, uh, KR Graphics. I'm looking at your, your question right now. I wonder how this can handle a full face rig similar to VFX rigs and Unreal MetaHuman. We'll get there. Um, and I think it'll be clearer why later in this presentation when I explain what, you know, what's going to come after this first implementation of view objects. So this is uh, just a, it's from Jan's War Jeep. Um, uh, you guys, you guys should take a look at Jan's work. Um, the war Jeep is just full of accurate um, vehicle parts, which kind of blows my mind. He, he actually has Brembo brakes on, on, on that, that car. It's crazy. Um, but his accuracy with the mechanical elements and how they're, they're placed on a car or connected on a car is so accurate. But you can see 17 80 FPS while increasing um, the number of spans that I have. Um, and then what I want to do is be able to wind it along the curve. And this is another one that I shaded this week, didn't get around to recording a new video on, um, but it, it was incredibly, incredibly fast um, with full shading actually in place. That, that, that new version is actually up on, um, uh, will be part of the, the content download packet. But you can see 30 FPS in, in 16.1, right? So it's not bad, you know, but let's take a look at 17.0. 90 plus frames per second. And so, again, this won't be what you see everywhere in Modo. And, you know, I am showing you the things that I found that are, are high performance because that's what I want to show you. You know, that's what I'm excited about. But this is what you can expect over time from Modo. More things like this, seeing these types of performance improvements. And so we will reach a point where Modo is just a performance powerhouse. And it's not going to be terribly long, you know, this year and next year, um, or I'm sorry, next year and the year after are going to be extremely interesting for us. So transforming the beginning of that, that spring, just transforming the curve that uh, is generating the geometry, 25 to 30 frames per second. And hopping on over to uh, 17.0, over 100 frames per second when doing that type of editing. All right. So nice, nice big change. Got to grab that. I feel like I almost want to move on because I, I want to make sure we save a little bit of time here. But there you go. You can see how comfortable that is. All right, so mesh op demo, and this is just mesh ops in general. I don't like the best thing about 17.0 is the mesh op performance. It's dramatically improved mesh op performance overall. 
Um, Matt Paquin sent me some great videos. I wasn't able to get them in in time. I wasn't able to edit them in in time. But, um, you know, we've seen a lot of great examples of how mesh shops are much easier to interact with. And this is just me turning on a whole bunch of layers in order and comparing to what that experience is like in 17.0 versus 16.1. It is so much more interactive in, uh, in 17.0. And uh, you can see through the the, uh, the the frame counter down there at the bottom what the difference actually is. So mesh ops is a definitely an area to to focus a lot of interest on because that is where you're going to see the most consistent benefit. It's much better. Um, but here's the other thing: if you work with mesh ops, you also know how to make a scene that won't run well on anything for the next 20 years. <laughs> so you can add too much stuff. There's no question about it. But anyhow, um, big improvements for mesh ops. And uh, let's go ahead and hop on over. And so simple transforms. So this is, you know, what I showed in the, the first kind of demo -y video. And that's, you know, just doing simple tire transforms or hood transform, moving a mesh around. Big difference here and, uh, you know, big improvement. So Again, sharing these videos, please take a look at them. So that's 12.5 frames per second and, uh, in 16.1, and then 30 frames per second in 17.0. So pretty, pretty, pretty large uh, difference. It does lag behind, you know, just like, you know, uh, other mesh or component transforms uh, that we showed. All righty. And, uh, and so here we are. Uh, let's go ahead and skip on over to... Um, another simple transforms example. I, uh, this is something I just couldn't do in the past. We made a lot of improvements in the 16 series and the 15 series where this is doable too um, in, in the 15 and 16 series, um, moving a really dense mesh like this around. It's not bad. I can do it, um, but it's so much more comfortable in 17.0, like just such a, a quality of life improvement because there's a lot of times you need to come into Moto and work on a dense mesh, even though there's a, there's a lower subdivision level of these these dense meshes that need to need to be rebaked. But definitely one of those those notoriously challenging uh, bits. And so let's go ahead and come on over. And uh, Alf, uh, Alpha user Kimo Hellstrom uh, shared a, an interesting mesh op demo, and you know. As you can see on the left-hand side, he's using Fraps. Uh, he also has a very high-resolution monitor, so 5 FPS is what he was getting while he was interacting, and over here he's getting 56. Um, you can see that the curve does, or the geometry lags behind the curve, but it's ironic. The difference in FPS doesn't even communicate the difference in feeling. It is fantastic. And so he's grabbing the end. We'll play his whole video. I just really appreciate this one. This one really shows shows uh, you know common tasks in a great way. And uh, there we go. Everyone should take a look at uh, Kimo's live streams that he's been doing is, is modeling live streams. He's doing some really interesting organic stuff that's extremely challenging. All right, and uh, another one from uh, Alpha user Kimo Hellstrom, a mesh op demo. And this one really shows well. Uh, it's a dramatic difference. So 16.1, you know, the FPS flies around all over the place, but it keeps on stopping. And uh, it's very low. And you see immediately in the 17 alpha, highly interactive. Um, and then it comes back on over to 16.1 and the hauling of it. It's just, it's, it, it shows a decent FPS, but it's painful. Um, and you get this great update. And so it's basically just a, a fall off controlling uh, some, uh, some bevels, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Some polygon bevels. Okay, now let's go ahead and go on over here. Um, thank you, Jen, for flagging that, and I will come back to it uh, a little bit later. Um, okay, you know what? Yeah, Mike, totally. Yeah, you can put some videos up. Um, now, please <laughs> have them be fairly positive. Um, if you're on alpha, it's a public alpha. We won't be restricting you from doing things like that. All right, and uh, Alexander Jaggy. Um, is uh, a, 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 an alpha tester who sent this over. By the way, I probably just butchered your name, and I'm sorry for that, but an interesting example of loading um, and the speed of loading. Now, again, this is not going to be everybody's experience on every piece of hardware and every scene. It depends upon your scene, and I think Alexander puts together pretty good scenes because look at this. It's a, you know, it's a jumbo jet, and I do. I love seeing those bits load in there. He might not have been able to interact with it yet, but he should be able to, and that's the goal. And he's timing it because he loaded them both at the same time, right-hand side, 
we have uh, you know Moto 16 one v8 on the left hand side we have 17 0 and so this is an interesting case where you know we want to know more about this scene like what okay why you know like we want to we want to evaluate it right and there we go finally got there but a dramatic increase in in uh, speed as far as being able to load this up right okay and uh, let's go ahead and pause that and move on to the next one all right so that's the end of the demos on view objects and incremental tool updates there's a whole lot more there I mean you're going to see stuff in many different areas of the application. Just please understand it is going to be very crashy. It is also going to have a lot of hangs because that's actually what we're fighting against right now, hangs that don't recover. And uh, that is a problem for us because you don't get enough data um, from that because it doesn't produce a crash report, right? And uh, this is something that we have a process you can follow. We'll share that video as far as how you can get us the data, a dump, um, to let us know what's going on. So Mike Jensen made that. We'll include it in the download. And 17.0 feature enhancements was kind of surprising. Um, you know, just there were a lot of nice things that people at, uh, on our team did that turned out to be true feature enhancements and, and, and actually new features in some cases. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look through these. Uh, why did I go back? There we go. Okay, so primitive slice. Um, primitive slice now has clone and a corner radius option. And so uh, nice addition from Taz there. I think we need to do a lot of work on primitive slice. I know Greg Lundberger agrees with me. Um, it's a great tool. It has a lot of potential. We need to spend more time on it. And we're going to see what we can do about that next year because uh, it just needs a few more things. And it's just an amazing, amazing tool. And it applies to some of our future plans that I'm not going to share with you guys today or uh, anytime too soon. But anyhow. Really great addition from Taz. Polyhaul, this is awesome. There's a whole bunch of additions, but the only one that I included a video on is this self-Boolean mode. And so as you can see, as we uh, an extrude was performed on two pieces of geometry that cross each other, they automatically Booleaned. And this is very interesting stuff. Um, Kara Graphics, we are gonna marinate it. You are going to, uh, you're gonna be helping us marinate it. That's what we need a lot of. All right, and uh, icon interface. This is just a direction we're going with UI um, where we wanna have more icons for controlling modes as opposed to these lists and lists and lists, right? And it's just, it's more intuitive to a way to understand what an option does, right? Like topo pen, that would be so helpful in topo pen. But this is just us kind of playing around with it being like, okay, this is something we should do. More on UI later. Radial line. Um, uh, uh, when I first started using Moto, it was called Perfect Circle, and it was by Seneca. And, uh, and Taz implemented a great version, like a uh, like an improvement of it. That's in 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 in, uh, in you know internal code. But this actually now can do a partial radial alignment, so you can go ahead and reduce your arc. And that's actually, I mean, it's it's simple. It's not a huge addition, but it's really valuable. You know, I also put in a different request for another linear align thing from him. Uh, so hopefully, we'll see that next year because. I think it'd be great for topology, but anyhow, um, mesh cleanup. Okay, this is this is like my my moment where I get to kind of do like a uh, an infomercial pitch, like where it's like, have you ever made a mesh where all of a sudden you found out one polygon wasn't connected to the other anymore? Well, no longer with the new mesh cleanup fixed gaps option. Anytime you have a hole in the mesh on co-located edges. Mesh cleanup will fix those gaps for you because you see that type of stuff drives you nuts when you're modeling. And so this was a really nice, simple addition to mesh cleanup that is super, super valuable. And so now he grabs those same vertices. It's connected. Important addition, small, but important. Uh, decal planer. Um, you know, we've released planer decals. Uh, in 16.1, I'm really proud of this feature because I, I helped design it and it, um, it was a challenge to work out how to do this with Modo and Taz just did an amazing job of implementing it. But there's a lot of things going on and it's really challenging uh, to manage and it also adds performance overhead. So what, what's happened is now we can use replicas directly as opposed to passing them on to a merge mesh and then using that merge mesh. So it's removing a very performance intensive aspect of the decal planer tool to make it faster. Alrighty, so um, this is great. 
And it also is an indication, a strong you know, indication of the direction we want to take workflow in Modo. Um, when procedural modeling first came out, uh, I think everybody was like, wow, it'd be really great if you know, we could use the same keybinds as we use for direct modeling tools uh, for mesh ops, right? And Ben has done this. So tool handles will display quick calling for mesh ops. Let me just let you watch Ben um, explain this. Hello, so this is a video demonstrating the work, uh, improvements we've made to the procedural modeling workflow. Um, so it's all minor things that hopefully makes it nicer to use. Um, so the first thing we'll do is when we add a mesh, uh, a mesh uh, an operation, you'll see we're actually activating the tool. And what that's doing is that's activating a basically a version of the channel hall tool um, that uh, doesn't draw the UI up here um, and instead just uses this for your commands and that will work whenever you select an operation or whenever you um, add one it will it will activate that tool so it, you know in practice what that means is as soon as you as soon as you add an, add an op I can just drag to do the um, do the hauling which uh, previously, if you've tried mesh operations, that didn't work. So that just brings it more in line with the direct modeling tools. Um, you'll also note these tool handles and the holding will bring up this um, value HUD. Uh, if you want to edit those values, you can uh, just press tab and then um, press two meters and get it like that. So that's that. Um, the next thing is if you have an operation that is in the tool where the tool handles are drawn on the tool pipe, so where that is a, where that happens is with these clone tools. Um, they all had tool handles that you could use, um, but you had to drill down and select the generator to see them. Uh, now, as long as the mesh operation doesn't draw anything, uh, you can you'll see these tool handles um, when you've got the main one selected. Um, you can activate snapping and that should now work as well. So see we're doing grid snap here. Um, probably not the best example, but yeah, hopefully you can see that that's working. Um, Uh, I've added some shortcuts so that if you've got a mesh operation selected, um, if you press S, that will now add a selection panel for you um, under your mouse, so you can just select that. Um, like that. Uh, and if you do Shift F, Control F, no fall off seems to be broken but there is also a, a shortcut for fall offs um, to do the same thing uh, and if you if your mesh is procedural if you press tab the this add mesh operation will pop up anywhere wherever your mouse is so uh, you don't have to do it over here like you used to you can also press um, back tick which is the button above tab to open the tree. So the reasoning for that is you might want to do the operations like this where you've just got a big viewport then you can select your ops and move them around and do whatever you like with them. Um, there's a few commands that are going to move so in here you'll see this extra pause button there's this new merge meshes selected command so if I have this mesh selected and I press that I can make a new name let's call it Jeff uh, and Jeff will add a merge meshes with the currently selected mesh as a source um, and the only other thing is I've also added a uh, let's add a fall off to this as a good example. A new duplicate command. Um, so if you're in this 
list and you duplicate a an operation with control D uh, it calls a different command and what that will do is it will also duplicate all of the things underneath it uh, whereas previously if you do um, if you do the traditional duplicate it links it to the same fall off and it removes the selection um, but now it will also duplicate all of that and I think that's about it thanks Thank you, Ben. Um, the you know made M work to assign materials in uh, in in the mesh ops stack is okay. If you spend time in mesh ops, that's that's just gold. This is also just a shoot me like an initial indication of what we want to do. Also, the shortcut keys that will be used. It is being heavily debated in the alpha. <laughs> we'll discuss that more. Uh, it's the thing I'm the least worried about. It's very easy to figure out what shortcut we want. What Ben has, uh, has produced here is exceptional. Hello. Okay. And more Ben. All right. And so what do we got here? We've got procedural stack duplication. This is... Another one of those things that would be very easy to say that, you know, actually we probably should, uh, um, this should have been done before, and it, I think it should have been. Um, but this is a big change that, you know, um, Ben helped us out with. Hello. So I've added a command to help with um, duplicating mesh ops. Uh, so if you had this one, which is some bevels and a linear fall off, um, if you use the normal duplicate command, it's using the same um, the same fall off, which isn't necessarily what you want, and it'll do weird things with the selection and stuff, so uh, this is designed to not do that. So uh, if you press Control D here, or just do duplicate, duplicate procedural stack, uh, what you'll see is we've now got another linear fall off in place, so that got two different now they're not connected it's cloning everything um, or attempting to clone everything connected to it um, that's pretty much it it will basically go through every graph and try and connect try and make new what things for the selection ops and the tool pipes and everything else that's connected uh, there's a few options um, so if we come in here this one is a uh, selection operator so by default, all of these are off with the shortcut key, but if you were to um, clone this now, you'll see what happens is the selection op just pipes into the same math node, um, which isn't ideal in this scenario. So what you can do is if you come to the options, you can choose this clone channel links, and then that will clone everything that's connected on this channel link, which is these purple light purple, lilac, um, lines. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, it should attempt to clone everything. It might not make everything. Thanks. You're not wondering, but in case you were, um, we have a thing at Hello? Foundry called so, Foundry All-Stars. Ben has been nominated many times because Ben is awesome. And he's actually done some other things for 17 that couldn't get into the slide deck enough, like better selection visibility uh, for mesh shops that he just did this week. And interestingly, uh, it's actually a good story about um, what view objects is allowed for. If you wanted to make a change like that, it was in all sorts of different areas of the code in the past. And so when we had small requests, like, let's just change this color of this one thing, you'd get responses like, oh, it's a lot of work. And it sounds crazy, but it was. And part of what view objects has do done and bring a lot of things into a more more understandable organization and putting things in one place and sharing it multiple other places. And so Ben was able to go in and make that change super quickly when in the past it would have been a whole lot of effort. So great stuff from Ben and uh, great stuff that view objects brings to us. And so advanced viewport updates. Um, already showed you a few of these. Um, we took out the original mode of uh, um, ambient inclusion, only hybrid mode is available. We also, one I didn't show was we add a use texture checkbox. We, we'll talk about 
the way that 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 properties are organized later on in just a, you know, just a bit. Um, this allows users not to load textures in the viewport, but still load the materials. Um, it's being a little finicky right now, but the idea is that a lot of times people don't want textures or they don't need them. And so let's just turn off the textures. Um, you can turn off use shader tree currently in, in Moto 16.1, but that loses the material settings. And you often want the material item settings for multiple objects. And so it's just a nice refinement. And of course, wireframe display and default environment, uh, default plus environment that I showed you before. And can't thank Duncan and Hartman enough for just kicking butt on, on AVP. All right, um, you know what I'm excited about? I'm excited about our new crash reporter. <laughs> um, it's really good, it's really good. There's a few things we need to work out on it, like saving your name and email information between sessions, but it's just a much better uh, crash report. And there's a whole new system behind it too, uh, so we can catch more things. And so uh, you'll be able to know what you're sending to us and give us a lot of information. You could do this before, but it always felt disconnected from Moto. This feels like it's integrated. And this is, it, it's important, you know, like, we were talking about this in, a, in, in an internal meeting and my comment about it was when I saw this for the first time, it gave me confidence that what I was sharing went somewhere. Now, working here, I knew the other one did, but I also understand how users felt that it's like, is it though? <laughs> you know, This tells me that what you guys as users submit to us is important and it is. All right, uh, I couldn't get an image in time for this. Uh, fur vector grooming has been enhanced, which sounds like a really, really weird addition to 17. One of the things we started doing this year was taking some of our customers, our multi-seat customers and saying, can we fix three things for you? You know, like let's talk about things we can fix in a reasonable amount of time, but we wanna fix a few things for you. And we talked to Boxel. Um, we also did this with Seneca um, early, uh, or early uh, this year. And so we've added the ability to bake for vector images from for vertex maps, which is great. Um, Clyde with base service now works with vector guides and has an offset the user has chosen. Subdividing a mesh with fur vectors interpolates the fur vectors more intelligently. There's a new option for brushes to pass through a surface or not, and symmetry on fur grooming is way more, was significantly improved. And this is something I don't think most people are aware of, but our fur grooming as opposed to long hair grooming, our fur vector grooming is really cool. I've got some ideas on how to, you know, maybe make it better in the future, way past 17 you know, or after, you know, the 17 series. Uh, but it, 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 I could see it leading that into other things. But we wanted to give uh, Boxel, you know, um, what they needed so that they can use Moto for their fur grooming. And now uh, that will be part of 17 -0. Really great work from Richard. All right. And 17 -0 native Mac arm. All right, guys. This is when I actually need to just say, like, yeah, I told you last year we were going to have it out in beta. We couldn't get it out so you know my bad i am sorry that i told you we'd get it out in beta earlier but we just couldn't now it is actually just part of 17.0 period it will ship as part of 17.0 and it is part of the 17.0 alpha so if you have a you know uh, a new mac with an m1 m2 or m3 you'll be able to use this and i'm using the same slide from the uh, the last live stream you know, basically these are still the performance enhancements we see when we compare the same system on Rosetta 2 versus um, use, not using Rosetta 2, which is emulation. And so, you know, 30 to 50% uh, uh, speed improvements, which is, it's in line with what we've heard from other packages that move over to Mac ARM. And uh, I should turn off my video capture device. There we go. Yeah, and so you can see uh, pretty substantial improvement and uh, happy to get this in your guys' hands. The M1 uh, processors, processors are excellent. And so now we're a part of that world. 17.0 when? When? Question mark, exclamation point. What I always love to see in any text message, right? Extended public alpha starts late next week. We want your help mo making Moto the best it can be. Final release of 17.0 is scheduled for early 2024. That doesn't mean January. Early 2024, though. All right, guys, we we uh, we want to get this out to you for you know two weeks or so, and then internally we'll start working out like what the right timeline is. We probably won't share that with you right away, but the point is we want to make sure 
that this foundation we put in front of you is solid. And I mean, not perfect, but ready to move forward from. Because it's not going to be perfect when it comes out. There'll still be problems. But we want to put ourselves in the position where with each V release, we are able to keep on iterating on performance and stability and consistency. All right? Now, as we've said that, Moto 17.1 and 17.2. All right? Now, what are we planning for 17.1, 17.2? Uh, we got to give you a disclaimer first. It's a slightly modified disclaimer from last time. These are features that we will be pursuing during the Moto 17.1 and 17.2 release cycle. However, this is not a commitment to all of these features making it into a final release. We do not anticipate being able to complete every feature listed here. As features are developed during a release cycle, we often start with a wide slate of features we are working on. As the cycle progresses, we often focus more effort on one versus another. Uh, um, based on which will bring the greatest benefit to users or is capable of successful completion in a given time frame. So this is particularly true in the case of performance enhancements because, you know, like, you know, like just telling you our experience, we had a lot of things we experimented with this year that were like, that's interesting. We're coming back to that. <laughs> you know, like it was just too big of a thing to do this year. And we put it aside. And so just want to make sure this is clear to you guys. So in the interest of transparency, we are sharing our broad goals with users of Modo. Feedback from users does impact our priorities. Please feel free to let us know which features stand out from this presentation. Now, this is what, like, I don't think I did not communicate this well the last time. I consider completing 60% of the following features as successful. 70% means we kicked some serious butt. 80% means we have exceeded our own expectations wildly, okay? This is the right way to develop features so that you have the flexibility to choose the thing that's gonna get you the farthest. 17.1 feature list. All righty. Um, let's see if I can go ahead and uh, move this on down. Yeah, I can. So now I can turn my video on. Couldn't get it quite working in OBS uh, just a moment ago. More performance. So the next performance enhancement that is view objects related, because I think I've explained to you in the past, there's a lot of things we can do in view objects. A lot of things aren't worth explaining. <laughs> they just they just make things faster. But one of the more formal ones is the many object view objects type. And this is one that, uh, that Chris agrees extremely strongly with. Um, we should pursue that for 17.1. Also transform mesh edits, which is basically accelerating basic transform edits of a mesh. I mean, that is probably the majority of what people do when they model. There's all modeling tools are great, you know, but you probably spend a lot of time moving mesh elements around, moving vertices, edges, and polygons. So that's an, a very valuable performance enhancement. Dynamic deformer caching. All right, now, okay, I, okay, Red Gunner, just to be clear, I should have clarified this too to begin with. Each one has a P value next to it. This is how we categorize things internally. P5 is the highest, P1 is the lowest. P5 is the most likely to be done in a release cycle, but also could move on to another cycle. But anyway, dynamic deformer caching. We want to bring deformer caching back, but view objects lets us do it in a better way, which means since we have background threads or a background thread, we can calculate that in the background. And that way, when you go and you, you, you play back a, uh, an animation that has deformers cached, it doesn't have to play through the timeline before it's cached. It's just happening in the background on a thread. On, you know, we only have one right now, one background thread. Anyway, uh, weight painting, yeah, that's important. Um, we know that this is one that you guys have been wanting. It'll benefit us. It's, it's, I think it's what's kept people from using Moto for animation. You know, there's a lot of interest in animation in Moto in like 701 timeframe. And the weight painting is what kept people out of it. The workflow that Mark Brown did uh, around 701, I think it was 701, the, the post-based workflow was fantastic. I would love people to use that. And weight painting isn't just about um, rigging. Weight painting is a great way to shade your character and produce masks and all sorts of other things. So next up, UI. Yes, we are approaching UI. Now, if you notice, it doesn't say high DPI on here. We have steps we need to take towards a high DPI UI. And the first one is a UI refresh, which is just cleaning up the way that Moto looks right now. I'm sorry, folks, I do not like the blue slate background on our item lists and our schematic. <laughs> so little things like that, changing how things are formatted. It's basically, we're gonna, and, and also UI cleanup with that, which is 
refining workflows for properties and menus, they're, they're kind of mayhem right now. They're too deep. We're going to refine them. And we're talking to a lot of our, uh, our internal alpha testers about that. Matt, you know, Mateusz uh, Luzinski has a lot of great ideas and the designer working on Moda, Laura, has uh, um, been just doing an amazing job of putting together really great ideas. She's been heavily focused on OmniPy lately, but we can do a lot of cleanup for what is contained in forms and why. Um, so OmniPy is a new Pi menu system. It's QT based, right, it's QML. Um, and so it's a good place for us to start. UI refresh is easier, but OmniPy is kind of like dipping our toe into QML, which is what we would need for a high DPI update later. You are very unlikely to see a high DPI update in 2024. I just want to put that out there. But we are going to take all the steps towards that so we can get it to you, you know, after 2024 in a really good state. And Laura has brilliant ideas for what we want to do for that UI because then we have a whole lot more flexibility. So we've got to clean a lot. Pro like lots of our presets, they're crazy. You know, we got to redo that stuff. It's a lot of a lot of uh, user interaction work that we have to do to, to narrow that down. Tools, more tool performance optimization. Uh, the incremental update stuff, there's other little things that, that can be done as well. But just as an example of one, um, so tool performance optimizations is P5, it's super high. Slide itself is kind of P3, but slide, I love the slide tool. And uh, tool consolidation, there's some enhancements for the slide tool where you, maybe you could slide and push and automatically decide like it try okay so if you use the key bind for the slide tool um, it's context sensitive and so if you have an edge selected it chooses the radial option if you have a uh, vertex selected it chooses the linear option but there's also a face mode as well which I have no idea really how to get into that get into that because it still needs a vertex selection we are we think that we can actually arrange it so that you know, that works even when you click on a button and merge together the face mode along with the edge slide mode and, uh, and then add also um, an axis up from the surface along the normal, uh, off from, off, uh, perpendicular to the normal surface so you can offset the vertex and slide it. And it becomes an amazing tweak tool. Um, need to do a demo for you guys of like even how the slide tool works now. There's a lot of things that people aren't aware of. Next up, viewport, AVP refinement work. So that is just a lot of things. Um, uh, let's see, uh, one second I'll, before I go on with that. KR graphics, uh, how about a grid background? Oh, you mean, do you mean like a better grid background or something like that? I'm not sure what you mean by the, the grid background. Need a little bit more explanation, uh, KR graphics. Um, AVP refinement work is, there's a lot of things we need to do about AVP. Greg Leuenberger knows every single one of them. <laughs> like, and we're working with him on trying to isolate those. That's one of the things that Laura is dedicating her time on right now. And, uh, and, and we're trying to make sure we get everything in AVP working as well as the default viewport as far as, you know, visibility and behavior and stuff like that. Uh, Mike and I have been working on how can we make the advanced viewport suitable for lower end hardware. And it can be tailored. Duncan, who created AVP and the internal project that, that, that's part of, um, has done a brilliant job of organizing that or developing it. We need to organize it to make it more, more, uh, capable across more hardware. So we aren't going to be able to say AVP is the default viewport in 17.1. I don't think that's going to be ready by then, but we do raise the priority in 17.2 so that we can make AVP the default viewport and the best experience. I'd also like to do it when we get on to one of the next few objects phases, which is textures, and that, that, that'll probably land around uh, V2. All right, so stability and bug fixes, frequent V releases, super high priority, P5. Okay, two questions, um, or a few questions. Let's see, how about the new render window? Okay, so on the render window, Neo, there will be, I don't know if we'll be using that design that we, uh, we showed previously because the direction we were going may not be able to be used with that design that we showed before. And uh, the reason for that is the answer to the next question, which is Hydra. So Hydra is the reason, um, and it's a good reason. <laughs> so let's go on to 17.2. Performance, dynamic view object types. What that means is being able to, as performance slows down in the viewport, 
dynamically changing things, right? And so textures, that would actually apply to loading as well, where you'd load in the lowest mipmap level and let it populate through, kind of like you see in most game editors these days, right? Um, so that you can immediately start interacting. You get an idea of your materials, but it's not full res until it's done, but you can work, right? And that's super important. Subdivision levels, right? You could go ahead and move, uh, like a, if, if the viewport slows down, a lot like ZBrush, right? That was always a brilliant thing that they did, that is you rotate, you drop down to a lower subdivision level, you know? If you, I don't know about nowadays, but in the past, if you turned off that behavior, who slow to a crawl. And so it's something that we're going to be able to take advantage of easily with view objects in the future. Bounding box on load. First thing that comes to your viewport are bounding boxes. Immediately can start interacting. Bounding boxes are replaced with meshes. You know, Transform mesh edits V2. So there's a, like, there's a couple things we can do with transform mesh edits to improve it. And it's not just one version. And so we'll be continuing forward with that in 17.2 as a plan. Selection, selection hit testing. Um, this one's challenging. And so I'm giving until 17.2 for it. The priority might drop though, because it really is hard. But it's basically when you select something in the viewport, um, you have to do hit testing. You kind of raycast and see what you hit, right? So this is one that we want to get to. I'm not sure if we'll get to it during 2024. I did put it at P4, but I yeah, just kind of found out over the last day. That might be too challenging, but we'll see. Scene saving. We've debated. Which should we accelerate, scene saving or loading? Love to know what you guys think. My opinion is scene saving because scene saving is, uh, well, that's what improves autosave, right? And like, that's a frustration for everyone, how long it takes to autosave. So that would be my highest priority. Scene loading is dropped down at P1. You can see startup time. I'd like to accelerate that, but scene loading and startup time to me are kind of like, you know what? I'm okay with waiting as an artist for that. Let me save fast. And weight painting is 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 on here, right? And it's P3. And so we come on back here. It could. I think I just left it on here on the second one. Uh, that actually shouldn't be here on the on 17.2. Anyway. All right. UI. We will begin work on high DPI moto, um, but we're not going to be there yet, right? So it's P1 and this it's it's actually a high priority, but P1 as far as are you guys likely to see it in 17.2? No, you're not. Um, it's very unlikely, but we will be beginning work on it. OmniPy phase two, because we, there's a lot of things we want to do with OmniPy. So the first one would largely replace the functionality of the current one. It'd be a lot slicker and sleeker with some additional behaviors. Um, but we want context sensitivity. Um, so we want to first just do it globally. And then depending upon where you're hovering over, OmniPy would have different behaviors. That's a lot of menus to create. Um, and easy customization and easier way to customize, like maybe like the way that workbenches behave and stuff like that. So you don't have to go into the form editor. Currently, the plan is to use the form editor for the first version. Rendering. Did somebody mention Hydra? I think somebody did. We are incorporating Hydra. Um, we have been incorporating Hydra. Uh, the work on that has been going on and it will continue to go on. I showed you, I think a box with like primary colors on each face. Uh, uh, at the SIGGRAPH live stream, we've gone further than that. And we're also going to integrate uh, a third-party renderer. We can't share who that is just yet. We're working out the details in that. Um, but, you know, we are testing that out. And we've got some interesting examples. Yes, I said Hydra, Sonny. I did. I said it. And it's actually what you should say is Jamie said Hydra because Jamie's the one who said, yeah, that is what we're doing. Um, and that was, that was the, like, good because that means, you know, we're just a part of the rendering ecosystem that Hydra provides. It's not just about offline rendering. That also becomes about viewport, right? And uh, Hydra delegates for the viewport, but that is much farther away. It's just an exciting aspect of that technology. Tools, again, more tool performance optimization. I'm not gonna clarify what, because I wanna get, there, get closer to that point before we identify which ones we need to work on, because it keeps on shifting as we do more work. Viewport, AVP refinement work, and now becomes P5. I do want the viewport, AVP to be the primary viewport uh, in 17.2, and I think it's enough time to make that happen. And uh, yes, third third party renderer will be through Hydra uh, Sreco. Yeah, that's because any third party renderer that has a Hydra delegate can hook up to Hydra in pretty much any system that supports it, right? And that's what makes it so easy. No, actually, Hydra is not supposed to supersede AVP. AVP is going to become our baseline because I, I feel like we, we didn't pay 
close enough attention to it because we were just kind of relying on the default viewport. I also think that's unacceptable these days. Oh, geez, and I'm covering up with my video here, aren't I? Let's just go ahead and, yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Now you can actually see what I'm trying to talk to you about. Um, and so uh, AVP has a hydrodelegate. You know, whether or not we use that, we'll see. But AVP, it's built in, it's rock solid. We also can, you know, compare the internal implementation that Duncan did, which is fantastic, and compare it to a, a Hydra version maybe in the future. But AVP isn't going anywhere, but there'll be more viewport options. I would love to have a, you know, a ray trace viewport at some point, right? Hydra offers things like that depending upon the rendering technology you use and the, the capabilities that renderer supports. Um, and, uh, and so, um, it really is awesome, Matt. I, I'm loving it too. And I think we can, it's just, there's a few things, a few annoying things we need to work out. We got a bunch of them in 17.0 and I think we'll hit a few more. Um, does internal render support both CPU and GPU? I feel like if I answer that question, you'd have too much information, Neo. <laughs> like I feel like I'd basically be answering that question. Um, Let's just say I see value in CPU and GPU, and if we have Hydra, you're not gonna be limited by that. It's gonna be very easy to connect up any renderer to Moto, any third-party renderer. Uh, would, uh, Hydra could be a way to get V-Ray back. Uh, we haven't talked to, uh, to anybody about that, though. That is, you know, Chaos Group, that's not, that has not been a discussion. Let's see, uh, can, okay, I'm like, I'm in question mode now, question and answer, I guess that's where we're at. If you can, guys, I'm just gonna, keep questions coming, I'm just gonna note that Ken has a question, I'm gonna come back to it, right? Um, rendering, Hydra, all right, we, uh, we have incorporating, wow, I, uh, I clearly went over through this and edited it very well, I totally didn't finish this presentation five minutes before I gave it. Um, anyhow, Hydra, we have incorporated Hydra as the rendering API that will be part of Moto going forward. We aren't sharing which one, but uh, you know, this will open up access for any render with the Hydra delegate. So these are renderers, renders from that project internally. And uh, let me go ahead and turn off my video. And uh, yeah, these are all done in Modo via the first, you know, kind of proof of concept of Hydra. And I find this really exciting because I didn't expect to see what looks like real renders um, this quickly. And so Jamie, Jamie's become one of my favorite people. He's, uh, he's surly and he does great work. <laughs> and so great work, Jamie. Thank you so much for sharing these images. Really, uh, he likes to, uh, Jamie, uh, to explain Jamie Kenyon to you, uh, the architect on Moto. Jamie's basically Scotty on the enterprise. You know, he under promises and over delivers and constantly remember, reminds me I need to do the same. Materials. There will be multiple phases to inclusion of Material X. This is important for Hydra. It's also really very much looking like where we're gonna land or just as an industry, uh, you know, Material X is, it, it's gained a lot of support. And so that's what we're gonna move towards. We have some ways of implementing it fast in the beginning and then, you know, maybe more formally later on. But this does mean, and just to be clear, that at some point we're probably gonna start pulling out old material types. We'll translate, you know, shading for them. But, you know, hey, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you know, I, I, I don't want to see the traditional material ever again. Um, uh, I don't want to see energy conserving, uh, physically based and, uh, and um, principled are both excellent, but it's, you know, I want one. <laughs> I think it's causing too many problems and we can translate between them. Um, but that's, that's very much far in the future. And so this implementation will be material X material type, viewport evaluation and rendering. So you'll see material X in the viewport and presets. Well, I'm glad you relate to the party, Luca. You missed uh, <laughs> you missed what always happens in every demo. Next, we have a Black Friday sale. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn my video on again. So next week on Black Friday, go figure, um, we will start our Black Friday sale. It'll be running until the Tuesday that, or the Thursday that follows. So it'll be running for six days. And, uh, and so uh, and we haven't had a, a sale in quite a long time. And November 24th, 2023 through November 30th, 2023, those who want to return to maintenance. Now, we can't offer this for, you know, 
buying your maintenance that you renew two months from now, unfortunately. We just can't do that, unfortunately, guys. But if you want to return to maintenance, it'll be 20% off the uh, the cost of renewing maintenance. And, and, you know, so it'll be a very good price. And 30% off any new Moto subs. And so uh, definitely share the word because I think this is a good time to hop on and be a part of this. All right. And, you know, kind of finally, before I answer a couple more questions here, but the thing I want to communicate to you, and I hope this was clear, uh, let me turn off my video again. Um, this is the beginning, just the beginning of a new moto. The moto users have been asking for, we have a lot more work to do. Um, with your help on the alpha beta, 2024 is going to be remembered as the year Moto turned a corner and started realizing the potential we all know it has always had. Um, I'll come to the questions in just a moment. This is the beginning. It's going to look like the beginning. Um, Luca, I think Luca photoshopped my face on top of Bilbo Baggins and Slack. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. I think it's kind of awesome, actually. Uh, and I, but it also made me realize that maybe I, uh, maybe I actually look a little bit like Martin Freeman. Um, kind of disturbing. But it's the beginning. It's going to be the start. It's not going to be massively more stable, you know. Like, but we want to hit like kind of you know what we had in 16, and then from there forward, it's going to continue to get more stable. It's going to continue to get faster. Um, we have the right uh, right pieces in place to do this. And so, guys, um, I'm going to answer some of your questions right now. And my video capture device, why can't I grab it? Come on, video capture thing. There we go. We'll put that over here so you guys can actually sort of see me. I'm at that point in the day where the exposure in my room does not, or my office doesn't work at all. Uh, let me see. I probably should have noticed that uh, a little bit earlier. Eh, a little bit more light from the calendar. I'm lighting myself with my monitor. All right, so let me come on over to those questions and uh, get that over here so I can actually see some of them. Uh, back to Ken, right? Ken, you were you were up next on your questions. How far back were you, Ken? Let me see if I can actually find you here. There we go, Ken. How how you've been cleaning up Moto to make it easier uh, to implement future changes? Mansion analogy. Are there any plans? to and a more robust node-based system for the shader tree and or procedural system. Um, I, I, I actually think the procedural system has a very robust node system, you know, the stack nodes and stuff like this. Um, but it is very, you know, like, I, I totally agree with you. Um, it's one of those, let's see, um, I can't see everything. One second. Um, I've got some ideas on how a schematic and a, uh, a shader tree could kind of be mixed. Um, it's a lot to go into right now, and I'm having trouble with my screen and the way everything is organized, but we've got some thoughts on there, and it is something that we are in active discussion about. It's really very, very important to us. So, yeah, more on that later. That will... We'll talk about that probably this time next year. Gosh, I'm so dark. Ah, I need to stop trying to fix these things and just keep talking. Um, did you address GPU usage for Mac ARM? Um, how do you mean, Sonny? I'm not sure what do you mean Did we address GPU usage. I'm sure there's plenty of things that we need and can improve, but we're getting pretty good performance on it. Um, Luca, late to party. There was a big delay getting uh, to 16.1 and maintenance customers were given an extra month before charged and delay. Will this happen again for 17 if it's plus one year for a major update? Yeah, Adam, um, I'm not sure, sir, that that's going to be possible. Uh, and I can understand why you're asking the question. I set that precedent last year. Um, we really need your support on this. It would help us tremendously. Um, what I'm committing to is that next year you will receive three releases. Um, what you are getting is a, a year of updates. Um, this is kind of the moment that we have to reset. And so if you can accept that, let me know. If not, we need to know that too. So, you know, don't hide your feelings, but um, that's going to be hard for us to do. So happy for this roadmap. 
great to great to see you here Mar mario um the new crash report uh will be actually works i haven't seen crash report a long time not because i haven't cried yeah okay that had to go away <laughs> we were getting them though you didn't see a notification there was no ability to fill them in in 16.1 any updates for moto indy not yet um not 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 yet um it, we we aren't going to be continuing with moto indy on steam that is where it is, um, but we have other ideas maybe for next year. We need to explain that next year, and we need to nail that down. Not going to lie, if the roadmap for 17.1.17.2 was just performance, I'd be happy. It really is. Um, you know, These are peripheral things that I think are very important for us to tackle too. UI is very important, and moving us towards high DPI is very important. We've been talking about it for years. It has to happen. Um, there's no question about that. And man, Laura is so keen on that for sure. Um, who can I, sp let's see. That was hilarious. Um, or Palpatine. Ooh, I'm getting lost in here. Great roadmap. Thank you so much, Joaquin. Um, who can I speak to about maintenance issues? KR graphics, sales at foundry.com. So email sales at foundry.com. They will be very responsive. Um, and uh, let's see. Thank you so much, uh, Mike Gamby. You must leave the cave. No, Gamby, I'm not going to leave my, it's my cave. I'm staying in my cave. Great prospects. It is. It's the beginning of something new. Please set your expectations. This is not going to solve every problem you have. It's going to be, you know, there's going to be some difficulty when you, when you actually use it. Uh, but it's setting the right precedent for us to keep on improving from there. It's flipping a new switch, turning over a new leaf. Um, let's see, what do we got down here? I just, I think I saw another one. I think you need to focus on scripting and documentation. You, you're absolutely right, Dave, that we do need to spend some time on that. Um, yeah, I don't have anything to update you on on that, but you are absolutely correct. Um, things are going to change also uh, as we move through this series. So there'll be an additional need for that. Um, it's kind of a good opportune time. Well, uh, I am at the point where I have such cotton mouth, I can't, I can't make words. <sighs> Wellburn Laguin Day. I think it's good to support Mac since it's generally used by designers, specific, uh, especially on agencies. Yeah, it's great hardware too. It's really great, interesting hardware. Um, it, we want to support Mac. We, you know, we've traditionally had a lot of Mac users. It's just that was a lot of effort on top of everything else that we're doing. Um, and so can't wait to have that for sure. Someone else that the ARM version will use both CPU and GPU. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, I, you know what? I really don't know. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I'll get some more information for you on that, Sonny. Um, licensing. I was planning on getting back on maintenance and I couldn't add it to my cart. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you want to get back on maintenance currently, you do need to contact sales at Foundry. There should be a pop-up that tells you to do that. Um, but they will be responsive and they will help you out. Um, thank you, Lukash. I, I uh, appreciate you coming. Dave Usher. There's also an issue with, uh, let's see. No, I just lost it. Also an issue with split user base. There's people on the forum, people on Slack, people on Discord. Yeah, yep, yep, you got it, Dave. You're absolutely freaking right. Um, we're talking about that. And uh, like as a company, we're talking about that. Every product of this company um, uh, sees the same problem. Um, I have my opinions on what I'd like us to do, um, but it's a priority for us as a company right now. And I think we're all going to align under, you know, some kind of, kind of decision moving forward. I, I don't think forums are the right place to talk anymore. Um, it's just not how conversations happen uh, the way they did 15 years ago. And I think it's something like Slack or something like Discord and a way to save that information and make it persistent somewhere else as a posting board, something like that. You know, but anyway. So uh, let's go ahead and go on over to Gamby. Gamby's laughing at stuff again. Gamby. Nah. Looking forward to chatting with you later, Gamby. Uh, Dave, uh, M Misha at Dave. Oh yes, I'm not even a new user and I have no idea how to learn the recent features. Yeah, uh, well, there's not a whole lot of new features to learn. The ones I showed, they're feature enhancements. 
we, we will show you how to like, I'll make a video on, on the fur grooming stuff. <laughs> Nobody else can, um, but it'll be, you know, we'll, we'll get some basic videos. There's not a lot of new features. There's a lot of new additions to features, but that'll happen uh, by the time we get the full version out and we'll try and get, you know, some, some help for you guys during alpha. Uh, my experience with what you said about getting animators to new, use new software is to force them to use Modo by uh, attracting the modelers, riggers, and, and TDs to the package. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You need to give somebody else, somebody, a, okay, we need you as advocates, right? This is the way that I see how any piece of software, even most consumer products these days work, right? It's all about advocates. It's called influencers, and I hate that term at this point. Um, but it's all about like, you know, the Moto users helped sell Moto in the past, right? When I worked at a studio, I was talking to the freelancers who came in like, look at this amazing thing. And that's so important. And so my goal for this year, the real business plan for Moto is focused on current and past users. We want to satisfy you guys. We want to bring people back. We want to make the Moto that people expected, right? And give you guys a reason to come back. And when you do that for a customer, they become an advocate. And when they're an advocate, that's how it gets sold. And, and so it, to me, it's a very simple idea. And all we have to do is deliver on what we're promising to you and not overpromise, right? Okay, and um, let's go ahead and come on over to Yay, Yeah, Hydra and Shader Tree. I hope you have a bottle of Petit Syrah once Moto 17 drops. I hope I have a couple of them, KR Graphics. <laughs> uh, do you think it will be possible to have a, uh, a Moto-only site? Uh, can't really answer that. Uh, don't know. Um, but, you know, a little bit more prominence, uh, a little bit easier to find. Um, I definitely think so. And why is it when I scroll through YouTube's chat, I lose my place? I don't lose my place in uh, any other chat. And so uh, TeamSpeak... Yeah, Jen, by the way, thank you, Jen, for helping manage these questions. Some of you might have met her on a previous live stream. Jen has been instrumental in a lot of the things that are going the right direction right now for Moto. And I just want to share that with you guys. Jen, appreciate you just so much and everything that you've helped out with over the past couple of months. You are going to see, and you've probably seen the, the beginning of it, uh, of kind of a ramp up in marketing capabilities. We had an unfortunate internet issue today. That was just what happens. But man, I've gotten so much support over the past couple of months and from Foundry. We really need to praise them for that, you know. And uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. I think I prefer Slack. Moto Marketplace would be nice to have. Yeah, okay, that's that's fair. German Rabbit uh, can't comment on that yet. Um, but uh, I like uh, Advocate or Moto Not more than Influence. Yeah, I, I like Moto Not too. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, Advocate. You know, that's this is the way the world works. What about the possibility of lowering Moto's price so it would be more accessible to new users? That, that's something I really, uh, so many discussions need to happen internally about things like that before you can talk about it publicly. Um, we are sensitive to costs, especially, um, you know, in our industry, our primary industry, visual effects. Artists have been severely affected um, this year. Uh, fortunately, the strikes are, those major strikes are over and things are moving forward. Um, uh, but we are sensitive to that need. Um, so not anything I can answer uh, right now, but we're sensitive to it. Um, chemo, I also monitor Slack and Discord. Yeah, I'm on Discord all the time. I'm on Slack all the time, obviously, too. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's to me, it's either or. We want to hear more about uh, you guys. Turn on some lights. Uh, let's see who, who let's, yeah. I, it's my exposure. My webcam is not behaving itself, kind of. Eh. Ooh, jeez. And uh, you see what happened? The moment I try and actually get under the light, I end up uh, screwing everything up. Let me see if I can do something over here. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I've got this gigantic wide screen. And so when I move things around, things go on top of each other. And, uh, and it's really annoying. So there we go. Kind of kind of bottom lit. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I also like dark mode. I actually, when I go outdoors, I, st I started not wa wearing sunglasses when I go for a jog or a walk. I don't wear sunglasses anymore because... I have to wear sunglasses outside or have for the past 20 years, and I'm trying to train my body to be able to handle sunlight again. So interesting stuff. 
Um, yeah, I understood ger German Rabbit. I meant to say that you would like to see a Moto Marketplace. I think it would be very useful as well. Um, I, I think it would be best handled as something external from Foundry. Um, anyway, those are things that um, I think with the right community and the right focus on Moto could end up happening, you know. Um, but it's not stuff we have uh, up to the, up, up just yet. Moto Ambassador, Chemo, you're great at this stuff. I remember Jen Goldfrench from back in the day. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Misha, um, okay, when will we, uh, like, I'm, I'm losing uh, my place again. Mike, how and where can I best share videos of Moto content I, uh, and post on YouTube for Moto users and possible future Moto users to see? Um, I, I would say, yeah, YouTube, uh, you know, um, you, I would create my own channel and, and start posting those on YouTube, share them with us. Uh, that'd be great. I, I think that's definitely the best, best place for sure, and we'll pick them up. Yes, Moto needs more users. Lowering the price plus an NC version, crucial for Moto to grow, required in my opinion. Yep, yep, I hear you, Greg, I do. Um, no, can't really say anything about it right now, but respect the heck out of Greg's opinion. Um, Jen Goldfinch, care of graphics, hopefully in a good way. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, in a good, if he met you at a trade show, Jen, geez, come on, you know, like, you know, why do you not, I'm like, yeah, everybody enjoys meeting you, Jen. Um, ch -ch 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 Okay. Well, don't give Jen a hard time. We're ramping up our marketing stuff. So positivity will go a long way, guys. Um, Non-commercial plans, we'll talk about that next year. Um, once we get, you know, closer to 17.1, we'll start, we'll start talking about if we have non-commercial plans. We currently um, do not have any plans to share. Uh, I was able to add to my cart and we're happy. Great. Yeah. Uh, there was a problem this morning somebody had, and I, I did flag it and sent it off to, uh, the team. And so they might've, they might've fixed that. I just haven't even had a chance to read that email yet. Uh, it is live chat for me, uh, Milos. It's just that for some reason, when I scroll, it, it doesn't get out of order. It like most things like this, most chat, uh, uh, lists, I have an easy time following, but for some reason, this one, I have a very hard one. Milos always solves problems. Milos is one of the engineers on the Moto team who's done awesome stuff for you guys. A trial version of Moto uh, where you don't have to sign up for anything. Just download it and give it a spin. It, 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 yeah, we, we understand you. Um, I'd love a Moto marketplace. I'd sell my training. Yep, okay, all right. Soft homage, not light wave. Yeah, okay, ah, there we go. Okay, the Gen and KR graphics. Oh, you were an XSI user. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. What I've been working on with Jen is making sure we have the largest possible impact. And one of the things that Jen has been really, really good about is making sure that we step into it. You know, we're not going to just jump into that, that pool. This is something that you've got to kind of build up and make sure it's sustainable. You know, it's something that we've taken a few initiatives in the past and then it kind of gets overwhelmed. And so Jen is making sure that we do this right and we do it well as far as marketing engagement is concerned. And you'll see that continue to increase, uh, you know, throughout, uh, throughout this next year. Gamby, I will talk to you later on discord buddy and uh i think it gives better scripting tools make it more available to everyone to start seeing people build tools yeah i think well i think there's even better ideas uh, or not better but easier ideas like uh, assemblies wrapped up as tools in a smarter way right um need to clone a lot of soft that would, that would solve so many issues hey you know um i mean what software doesn't clone other software that has good ideas um but I also think we've got a lot of really great ideas. Um, uh, we just need to get to them, you know? Uh, I've got a lot of designs from when I was a designer. I wanna see implemented. Laura's been putting together fantastic stuff. We wanna see these things happen. I think we've, I think we've got a good plan. We just gotta make sure that we get towards it. Did we mention a, a rendering solution? Uh, hey, what's up, Alex? Uh, we did not mention which one. We did show Hydra. And so if you look a little bit earlier, you'll see the Hydra portion. Um, but uh, Hydra has been worked on. We are planning on having that, you know, end of next year, end of next year. Um, we can't tell you exactly which renderer yet, um, but Hydra means that any third party renderer could be connected up to a piece of software with surprising ease uh, compared to the way that, you, what you had to go through in the past to hook up a renderer to a, a piece of 3D software. Um, 
Have I missed anything? Are we VR plans? No, we did not share any VR plans. Uh, I have two VR headsets hovering above my head right now. I guess you can't see my cables running along my ceiling. I am passionate about it, but it's not what we should focus on right now. Uh, I'm a big fan of Star Citizen. I really want to see VR in Star Citizen. I want to see VR uh, specifically for the flying part of Star Citizen. They're not doing it yet because they've got other things to do, and they'll get there, and that's where we're at. Yeah, too cool. Okay, that's interesting. Moto needs a rebrand of Moto 3D. Yeah, you know, uh, I, uh, if Moto ever had a rebrand, it would need to be done at the right time. You know, once it really is a new Moto, we're at the beginning of a new Moto, and when we're able to say this is the new Moto, that might that may that might make some sense. Um, yeah. All right. Still great to see speed improvements. Yeah, they're they're very significant. They also are not everywhere, and. You are going to be using an alpha. It is going to feel like an alpha. You'll see where the benefits lie. And just please keep in mind, this is the foundation we need to continue performance enhancements. And, uh, ch -ch -ch oh, no, Dave, don't worry. Um, oh, MSTL, no worries. Pleasant. Feels like the honest live stream. I watched about software. Great. I'm glad that that's the goal. Um, and, you know, we owe it to you guys. You know, we really do. Um, yeah. Oh, Dave, no worries, man. Uh, uh, I just, there are things I want to talk about. I can't talk about, so I should stop talking. Glad I haven't been drinking <laughs> a lot of work done, a lot of work done, a lot of work to be done too. When can you announce a renderer? Um, that depends upon conversations between companies, right? And so just rest assured we are testing a renderer out in Hydra, and we are working on Hydra. That is the most important thing. And again, any renderer with a Hydra delegate could get, could get connected up afterwards. We are not going to commit to, uh, okay, Sunny starts when they're coming out with Squadron 42, 10 years. Hey, they just announced the Squadron 42 that they hit a major milestone, and they're still not setting a date for it, but it looks awesome, man. And anybody who... Who hasn't tried Star Citizen? I, I down I paid for it ten years ago, right? And uh, I downloaded it just to check out a video card I bought recently, and it just completely wrapped me up. The persistent universe of Star Citizen is amazing. Can't tell you, Daniel, when we would when seventeen two would be landing. Um, approximately is uh, late next year, right? We're coming out with uh, seventeen zero early next year. We're coming out with seventeen one towards the middle of the of next year. You know, middle, late, and uh, and then we're coming out with 17.2 towards the end. That's the goal. Base robot. There we go. Moto 17 Foundation release has such a nice ring to it. You know what? You, that, you, that, yeah. Yeah, Red Gunner. You're absolutely right. I agree with you. Um, the Moto Discord server was mentioned several times now. It might sound stupid, but I wasn't able to find a link to it. Uh, I think you, it's hard to find. I had the same problem. I, <laughs> I'm actually not a part of it uh, because I couldn't find it. But I think you need to have like an invite or, um, yeah, yeah, there's a way to access it. I think you have to be approved to get in. But, um, yeah, uh, Discord is a nice location. Uh, let's see. Any plans to integrate uh, some AI app for shaders? We are looking at machine learning things. Hard to talk about machine learning because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of aspects to machine learning that require a lot of conversation within companies as far as copyright is concerned. So we're very interested in it. You know, we have Copycat for Nuke, which is amazing. Um, and, uh, and we want to pursue this, but we also want to make sure we do it right where it doesn't put us at risk or our customers at any sort of risk. And we also want to preserve um, the rights of artists, which is another issue. So we're pursuing it in a responsible and ethical way. Um, so nothing specific to share with you guys yet on that. Is the new Moto logo in the background or just another perspective? Uh, just another perspective. Beautiful image by Volker Troy. Um, you know, I, I love this image. Volker, Volker does great stuff. Um, should have shared more of his renders. Every one of his renders is just pretty. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. way back for 2025. Yeah, 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 yep, yep. It'll happen fast, though. I promise you that. And we'll 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 give you a lot of things to love on our way there. The V releases. I'm suspecting next year, 
you guys are going to find exciting because uh, as we wrangle stuff. Um, what I didn't get into, and I wanted to get into this more, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it here at questions. And after this statement, I'm going to go ahead and move on. And I guess some people will miss this. I should have talked about it earlier. I kept on mentioning that we're pushing to a single background thread. All right. That's intentional that we're sending it to a single background thread because we need to be responsible in how we're approaching this development because many background threads can create more problems. That also is a possibility for the future after 17L, right? And uh, it's one that when it will really get interesting where, you know, 3D applications are challenging because they're kind of like game game engines and games and that there's a lot of different things going on all at the same time and so we can send separate things out to separate threads eventually so 17.0 will likely be uh, single background threaded but after that we'll be able to turn on multi background threads and that that's not multi threading for a tool for instance just to be completely clear right that's not you know using you know, five threads on bevel or something like that. It's not what it is. It's sending stuff out. And that'll also help with animation stuff, but we got to align all that stuff together. All right. And so more on that later. Um, it's not really part of a 17.0, but it's, it's what we're moving towards. And it's something to look forward to, you know, during 2024 for sure. Yeah. A lot of small V1, V2, V3, V4. Um, and yeah, well, you know, I don't want to tell you how often um, uh, V releases will come up, but frequently um, we're working on that. You know, we, we want to we want to get more releases out more quickly. Uh, uh, we don't want we don't want users have to wait for things. There's even conversation about rolling out a feature when it's ready, and then marketing the things that we added when they were ready. Once we get to a point release, so you guys are keeping keeping on getting things. But these are discussions we're having internally. Uh, Moto non-commercial. Oh, sorry. There, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Not, not right now. Uh, nothing to talk about. Um, yeah, nothing to talk about as far as non-commercial just yet. All right, guys. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for being so patient with us with the technical difficulties. Um, but I've been really excited to share this with you. But to finish off, just want to clarify, please. I know people are excited about this. I don't want you to be too excited because. It is an alpha and, you know, you're always going to want more. But what we needed to give you is, you know, the foundation that we need to make it better and better and better and better on a rapid pace. And the things behind the scenes we've done for Moto at Foundry, the things that Foundry has kind of instilled in recent development practices with all our software here um, are really going to start reaping benefits for us in 2024. So this is the beginning, beginning of a new moto. Just, you know, it's not going to solve all your problems. Not everything's going to be faster, but it's the step towards that, you know. All right, guys, have a great weekend. Have a great evening. If you're off next week, enjoy your Thanksgiving break. And uh, we will be talking with you, uh, you know, frequently during the, the alpha process. Have a good one. Later, later.